Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Allen, and I'm the president of the Brookings Institution. It's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you today to our event, Gender Equality 100 Years After the 19th Amendment. The text of the 19th Amendment to our Constitution reads as follows. The right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. Now, our event this afternoon celebrates the ratification of that powerful text, as well as reflects upon all that it has meant for our nation's history and for us as a people. By granting women the right to vote, the 19th Amendment confirmed the citizenship and the rights of th and thousands of American women, affirming the success of a decades-long struggle waged by courageous and pioneering women across America, often at great personal sacrifice. The significance of this cannot be overstated. After all, the mere ability to vote equates to the ability to be seen, to be recognized, and to affect change, all as part of our sacred democratic process. And it confirms our long-held belief that all people are created equal. However, as hard earned as this victory was, the 19th Amendment did not achieve a higher promise of universal suffrage. It wasn't perfect. For as much as it guaranteed this right to some women, it did not guarantee this truth to all. Indeed, despite the precious, long, yet long overlooked contributions of many black suffragists, such as Ida B. Wells and Mary B. Talbot, another generation of young black women and men would have to again take up the mantle to secure this right and more, both through the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement of the 1960s. Similarly, Native American, Hispanic and Asian American women would have to fight and wait decades after the ratification of the 19th Amendment until, until they too were granted their full and rightful ability to cast their ballots. The story of these individuals is that of our nation, and that story and our nation is laid bare by it. And it's one we're seeing play out again today as daughters and sons of many of these same brave Americans again and again fight for equity and for justice and for the true promise of America that we all hold so dear. That journey and that fight is never truly over. We have a long way to go and we all have a duty I believe a sacred duty to ensure the sacrifices of those courageous individuals are not forgotten and are never ever in vain. Now happily despite these many challenges, women have achieved significant political representation in the past hundred years and have been appointed to our or elected to some of our highest offices in Congress and in our most senior positions in government. Indeed, in recent decades, we've seen women surge in, in the entering into politics, with women in both political parties running for and ultimately achieving nominations for both the vice presidency and the presidency of the United States. And we're here again. It's a great moment. And one need only look at the 2018 elections to see the spectacular array of female leaders, many of them from diverse backgrounds, taking up the banner of a new generation of political leadership. These electoral achievements have been complemented by women serving in the most important and senior positions in the executive branch of our government, as ambassadors, as secretaries of department, and as women who've held and led our national security and national foreign policy processes as well, as secretaries of state and as national security advisors. We should celebrate these achievements, these victories, but we must also remain cognizant of where we fall short and remain vigilant in our commitment to remedy these shortcomings. After all, despite our constitution, modified over the years through amendments, having granted enfranchisement to most Americans, there remain major social and economic barriers that keep many, especially women of color, from exercising such rights. It is then during anniversaries such as these we were often quick to celebrate our achievements, that we must be just as quick to acknowledge our commitment to ensure we do not repeat these mistakes. 
especially as we turn to the 2020 presidential election, where the votes of American women may very well decide the final outcome, and thus the future trajectory and the character of our nation, we have a special obligation to reflect on these many challenges that have brought us to this moment. And for me, it comes down to this. A hundred years from the 19th Amendment, I believe on 3 November, American women will determine what the United States will become in the 21st century. Now against that backdrop, Brookings remains an organization dedicated to supporting the public good and to defending and uplifting the shared and cherished values that have brought out the very best of America and the world. That is why this year we're very proud to launch our 19A Brookings Gender Equality Series, which examines the legacy of the 19th Amendment across the country and the state of gender equality around the world, featuring essays and including some of those who are joining us here today. 19A illustrates both the progress and the work needed to advance a more equitable society. So with that, let me preview and introduce some of our keynote speakers today uh, who will be able to speak to the importance of the 19th Amendment and much more. In speaking order, uh, we're delighted to first be joined by Tina Chen. Tina is the president and the CEO of Time's Up Now and the Time's Up Foundation, her organization, which started as a grassroots movement combating workplace harassment in the entertainment industry, has fast become a true leader in fighting to make the workplace an equal and fair uh, environment for all. Prior to her current role, Tina served on behalf of the Obama administration, notably both as the chief of staff to First Lady Michelle Obama, and then later as executive director to the White House Council's Women and Girls Initiative. Tina, thank you for being here and joining us today. You truly honor us by your presence. Following Tina's remarks, we're equally pleased to welcome Dr. Madeleine Albright, uh, who will have a discussion with Brookings Senior Fellow, Dr. Tamara kaufman Wittes, Tammy, uh, and Dr. Albright uh, was named the first female U.S. Secretary of State under the Clinton administration and is, in my and many, many others' view, one of the truly great American leaders and icons of our modern era. Since leaving government, Dr. Albright has served as the chair of the Albright Stone Stonebridge Group and is the author of multiple best-selling books, including her recent book, Fascism, A Warning. Uh, which was discussed with former Brookings President Strobe Talbot here at Brookings, and we were honored for that evening. And not surprisingly, uh, Secretary Albright is a recipient of the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Madam Secretary, thank you so much for joining us, and it is a great personal honor for me to welcome you. After that conversation, we'll hear from historian and writer Dr. Susan Ware, in 20th century women's political and societal history several seminal books on this topic, including, most recently, Why They Marched, Untold Stories of the Women Who Fought for the Right to Vote. Thank you, Dr. Ware, for your scholarship on this vital segment of American history and for joining us here today. And finally, in the second half of our event, we'll move uh, over to a panel featuring several of our superb Brookings scholars, Drs. Makeda Henry Nicky, Elaine Kmark, and Bell Saulhill. And they will be moderated in that conversation by Dr. Camille Bissett. So before I turn the floor over to Tina, a brief reminder that we're very much on the record today and we're streaming live. Throughout the event, please feel free to submit your questions via email to events at brookings.edu or to Twitter at, the, at hashtag 19A. So with that, thank you all for joining us today. It's an important moment in our history, one that will set the trend for the future. I truly believe. And Tina, thank you for starting this event with us today and the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you, President Allen. It is my true pleasure to be here with Brookings, here virtually. Um, Brookings was such a great partner when I was in the Obama White House on issues of gender equity. And you know, it is always a delight and an honor to be anywhere, even virtually with Madeleine Albright, I have to say. And I'm just deeply, deeply honored to be on this program with you, Madam Secretary. Um, and you know, I'm here to talk about the 19th Amendment and yet the road we have ahead as President Allen laid out. You know, as we celebrate the passage of the 19th Amendment, it was the culmination 
of a struggle that dates as far back as our nation's founding, because many of you will remember when Abigail Adams admonished her husband, John, to, as we know, quote, remember the ladies when constructing the, quote, new code of laws and the vision of America, he forgot. Uh, and so began the fight, you know, for recognition that would not be won, as President Allen noted, until courageous women spoke up, protested, went to jail, even sacrificed their bodies to lay the groundwork for an inclusive future. And as, again, President Allen noted, even as hard fought as that victory won, it was not complete. It was not complete for Black, Asian, and Native American women who would not fully realize voting rights for another half century. Um, and it's a ballot battle for the battle box that I will sadly say continues to this day as voter suppression um, still threatens our democracy with people of color in particular being the victims of targeted disenfranchisement. And we also know that voting rights didn't translate fully into political power. Um, today, women make up only a quarter of Congress, even though they're 50% of the population. Black women make up less than 5% of Congress, but they're 7.6% of the population. The 2020 presidential race was met with the promise of six female candidates, but that number slowly reduced to zero. So 100 years after the 19th Amendment, although as President Allen noted, we have had women nominated for the two highest offices in the land, we still have yet to have a woman president. And a woman has been nominated for vice president by one of the major parties only three times. And we also know that despite our efforts in diversity and inclusion over these same decades, many of which I participated in my legal, own legal profession, the numbers remain dismal. The most recent data shows that of Fortune 500 companies, only 7% of CEOs are women. Only three are women of color. Today in 2020, not a single Fortune 500 CEO is a black woman. And this was before the pandemic and the economic crisis unfolded. What the pandemic has revealed are the pressures on working women that many of us have known for years and struggled with for years, but now the country as a whole sees them. The work we took for granted, like healthcare, caregiving, food and retail workers, they're now essential and women workers are the majority of those workers. According to the New York Times, one in three jobs held by women have been designated as essential jobs in this pandemic, with nine out of 10 nurses and nursing assistants are women. Women are the most respiratory therapists, the majority of pharmacists. They are an overwhelming majority of pharmacy aides and technicians. More than two thirds of the workers at grocery store checkouts and fast food counters are women. And in the face of these multiple pandemics of COVID-19, of racial violence and injustice, of economic freefall, we run the risk of an additional pandemic of invisibility, of dialing back on our efforts to achieve gender and racial equity in the workforce. I watched it happen during the last great recession in 08 and 09, when in the struggle to get people back to work and our economy back on track, key issues like equal pay, paid leave, fair pay and promotion practices, we're put on the back burner as we work to bring back the economy and get people back to work. I will say that back then we were only just beginning to understand that making sure that women, people of color, LGBTQ plus and disabled workers are able to fully participate in our economy is not just a nice thing to do when times are good, it is essential to building successful and resilient businesses and economies. As workers, we ourselves also didn't think of these issues like childcare and paid leave and flexible scheduling as public policy issues. Instead, we ourselves also thought of them as personal issues for employees to figure out on our own, not for employers or public policymakers to address how wrong we were. I'm proud that during my time in the Obama administration through our White House Council on Women and Girls, we made addressing working family issues key. I was a single working mom my entire career, as was Valerie Jarrett, who chaired the council with me. And the Obamas were two working parents with young children when they entered the White House. So we all had lived the experience of balancing work at home and yet we all acutely knew that we were the lucky ones. We all had means and support to raise our children while working full time. And it was still hard. How exponentially harder must it be for those working at minimum wage 
without even paid sick days, let alone paid family leave. So one part of our working families agenda was to compile and showcase the growing research that showed that working family policies, those policies that address the structural barriers that keep women and other vulnerable workers from succeeding in the workplace were actually profitable investments, not just costs to be managed. We held the first ever White House Summit on Working Families to showcase this research and the steps employers and policymakers can make now. And we work to change the narrative so that we all understand how critical these issues are, not just for individual working women and their families, but our entire economy. So the opportunity exists now that we didn't have 10 years ago to take this unprecedented worldwide economy-wide crisis and do better. We know that companies that have more diverse leadership are more profitable. We know that diverse teams make better business decisions 87% of the time. We now know that if workers are given paid leave, they can be more productive when they're on the job and that turnover of employees goes down so that these worker investments save money, not cost money. And we now know that if companies are more diverse, if women and people of color are fully represented up and down the wage scale, then work workplaces are safer, more dignified, more equitable. The lesson from the 19th Amendment, where the constitutional victory was not the end, but only the beginning of the fight to realize full voting rights for all women, is also one we see in our fight for fair, safe, and dignified workplaces for all. It was in the Civil Rights Act of 1964, where Title VII was enacted, prohibiting employment discrimination on the basis of race or sex. It was not until 1986 that the US Supreme Court recognized sexual harassment as a form of sex discrimination outlawed by Title VII. But legislative and judicial changes were not enough. Indeed, more than 30 years later, we know from the EEOC study in 2015 that 85% of women say they've experienced sexual harassment at some point in their careers that three out of four instances of sexual harassment go unreported and likely because the same study said that out of those who do report, three out of four say they suffered retaliation from making the report. And black women experience sexual harassment at the workplace at three times the rate of white women. Women are overrepresented in low pay jobs, jobs that are less likely to have worker protections and most likely to have incidents of sexual harassment. And then in October, 2017, it was through the courageous voices as it was a hundred years ago of women survivors and the reporting that brought their stories to light that exposed the true extent and prevalence of sexual harassment. That led to the outcry that became Time's Up and our first initiative, the Time's Up Legal Defense Fund, which for the first time provided access to legal support. And if survivors chose to speak publicly, to PR support for those women who either faced the threat of defamation lawsuits when they said, hashtag me too, or the thousands of low-income women who had no access to lawyers to bring lawsuits because their claim for wages were so low. And I'm proud to say that in the last two and a half years, the Times of Legal Defense Fund has connected over 4,800 people with resources, three quarters of whom are low-income women, 38% percent of whom are women of color. But while we continue to stand with survivors for justice, we also want to deal not just with the aftermath of sexual harassment after it occurs. Our bigger goal is a world where women are safe at work and able to reach their full potential, a place that is truly equitable and respectful for all. This is the transformational moment we were in back when I became the CEO of Time's Up in November last year a moment when I believed we had reached a tipping point where public policy, private sector leaders, and workers had come to the realization that change was needed. And then the pandemic hit, followed by an economic meltdown, followed by a long overdue reckoning about racial injustice. So now what can we do? At Time's Up, we have just issued a guide to equity and inclusion during crisis. In the immediate term, we need to do the work to be anti-racist, to not be silent in this moment. We need to care for our people, as in thinking about diversity and inclusion in all our decisions and equalizing our workplaces, especially realizing the different ways this pandemic or working from home are affecting workers 
and remembering that sexual harassment doesn't end just because work is remote and to demonstrate leadership, to lead with empathy and set the tone at the top. And deeply, deeply, we all need to seize this moment to re-examine our employment policies and really think about how to address the structural barriers that keep women from succeeding in the workplace. By providing paid sick leave, paid family leave, pregnancy accommodations, and caregiving accommodation. Because these are not just nice to do policies when times are good. They are essential for building a diverse, talented workforce that can compete in a 21st century economy. We remain one of the few industrialized nations in the world without a national paid sick leave policy. We had to scramble to put one together on an emergency temporary basis in the CARES Act. Think how much more prepared we would have been if we had a national policy already, if businesses had already built paid sick leave into their business plans. Businesses would have known what to expect and workers would have been able to stay at home when they were sick or when their loved ones got sick without fear of losing their paycheck or their job. And US businesses would not be competing at a disadvantage to global companies based in countries that already provide basic working family policies. But employers don't have to wait for a national policy to act on their own, and now is the time to do it. And finally, instead of creating a new economy where women and people of color can fully participate, we are entering a new crisis that may exclude working parents, especially working mothers, and reverse the gains we've made in women's labor force participation over the last several generations. While schools remain closed or only partially open, and childcare centers limited in capacity are going out of business. Working women, especially hourly wage and other workers without the means or access to private in-home childcare options are right now struggling with how to care for their children and keep their jobs. There are reports that many may opt to stay home and drop out of the workforce. There are many that don't have that choice and don't know what they will do. The New York Times yesterday published the results of their recent survey showing that 80% of parents working remotely or also during the childcare and education. And that falls to women with 54% of women saying they're mostly teaching their children. 29% of men said they would be doing the work, but interestingly, just 2% of the women said that their partners would be doing the work. And this will fall disproportionately on low-income women who can't afford to hire additional help, a double hit, as their children will miss out on the education that has always been the pathway toward upward mobility. This caregiving can no longer be seen as a personal issue for employees to figure out on their own. It is a public issue for private and, sec private and public sector leaders to address. So let's start collectively getting more creative and getting more nimble and flexible on how we solve these problems. Business leaders can ask, do you have vacant space that can become a childcare center? Can you partner with other businesses in your neighborhood on a solution? Can you put in mechanisms to help your workers help each other on Slack channels or create pods for themselves or flexible scheduling so workers can alternate work schedules and share care responsibilities? And policymakers need to start thinking outside the box on new childcare and public school arrangements to meet this moment and make the investments we need to provide quality care and quality education for all. So our centennial celebration of the 19th Amendment serves as a memory, as a reminder, as a clarion call to not just remember the ladies and their achievement, but to redouble our efforts to make the kind of systemic structural change that will fully realize the change in women's lives that was imagined a hundred years ago. This is our hundred year challenge and it is our time to rise to meet it. Thank you. Thank you, Tina Chen, for that inspiring and insightful keynote address. We really appreciate it. I'm Camille Busset, a senior fellow and director of the Race, Prosperity and Inclusion Initiative here at the Brookings Institution. And I will be serving as your moderator for the rest of the program. Welcome again, everyone. As you've already seen, we have an all-star lineup of impressive women for today's program. Our next panel will be a conversation between Secretary Madeleine Albright and Brookings Senior Fellow Tamara Kaufman-Wittes. 
Now, I hope that Secretary uh, Albright is well known to all of you, but it is always a pleasure to introduce women who have been pioneers in their domains. And Secretary Albright is certainly no exception. Dr. Madeline K. Albright, as John Allen has already mentioned, is a professor, author, diplomat, and businesswoman who served as the 64th Secretary of State of the United States. In 1997, she was named the first female Secretary of State and became at that time, the highest ranking woman in the history of the US government. Prior to her appointment as Secretary of State from 1993 to 1997, Dr. Albright served as the US permanent representative to the United Nations and was a member of the president's cabinet. She is a professor in the practice of diplomacy at the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. Dr. Albright is chair of Albright Stonebridge Group, a global strategy firm and chair of Albright Capital Management LLC, an investment advisory firm focused on emerging markets. She also chairs the National Democratic Institute, serves as the president of the Truman a scholarship foundation and is a member of the US Defense Department's Defense Policy Board. In 2012, she was chosen by President Obama to receive the nation's highest civilian honor, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, in recognition of her contributions to international peace and democracy. Dr. Albright is a seven time New York Times bestselling author. Her most recent book, Hell and Other Destinations, was published in April 2020. Her other books include her autobiography, Madam Secretary, a memoir published in 2003, and Fascism, a warning published in 2018. Madam Secretary, welcome. She is joined in conversation by my distinguished colleague, Tamara Kaufman Wittes. Dr. Tamara Kaufman Wittes is a senior fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy here at Brookings. Dr. Wittes ser served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern Affairs from November of 2009 to January 2012, coordinating US policy on democracy and human rights in the Middle East for the State Department. Wittes also oversaw the Middle East Partnership Initiative and served as Deputy Special Coordinator for Middle East Transitions. She was central to organizing the US government's response to the Arab awakening. Dr. Wittes, welcome. And I will let you take it from here. Well, Camille, thank you so much. Um, this has been uh, an educational and insightful and inspiring afternoon already. Uh, but I could not be more thrilled to be joined here by my mentor and friend, Secretary Albright. Welcome. Good to be with you. Wonderful, Tammy. So Secretary Albright, as you've heard, uh, one of our themes here in marking the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment is women who are trailblazers, uh, women who were first. And Tina Chen just spoke so powerfully about how few women are at the top still, either in the private sector or in government, uh, despite all of the advances that we've made but you have spent a lifetime being the only woman in the room or one of the only women in the room, whether you were working for Senator Muskie or for President Carter uh, at the UN, and of course, as the first female Secretary of State. So I wonder, as we think about this challenge of not having enough woman, women in the room, um, if you can give us some insight about what, what you found most difficult about being the only woman in the room, uh, the trailblazer. How did it change the way you approached working as a leader? Well, it's great to be able to do this and Camille and, and uh, Atina, it was wonderful to listen to them and delighted and uh, President Allen. So I'm delighted to be a part of this. Now, I've thought about this a little bit because I'm often asked the question and the bottom line is uh, my travel through life has gone up and down in many different ways. I went to a girls high school and a women's college where we had all the leadership roles. I was on the student council or I started an international relations club and was president or I was one of the editors of my paper. And then all of a sudden I get out of college and um, I am disregarded to the point where I decided that I was obsolete before I'd ever even started. Uh, and so getting jobs was not easy. And I decided to get uh, my, uh, go to school and get my graduate degrees. 
And the bottom line, I don't know how many other women have experienced this, but it isn't always men that make life difficult. I think that women are very judgmental about each other. And uh, there were those who'd say, why aren't you with your children instead of going to the library all the time? Um, and so I think we need to understand how we need to support each other. So that is one of the things. What is interesting, and that's why I say my uh, depiction of all of this is a little different from most people. At the time when people were looking for a woman for a job, the only job, I actually had my credentials together. So when Ed Muskie hired me to be his chief legislative assistant, I wasn't just his fundraiser friend, Madeline, I was Dr. Albright. And um, that was something that really helped, not only when I worked for him, but also when I went into the Carter administration, because Dr. Brzezinski had been my professor at Columbia. Uh, and there were a couple of women on the National Security Council staff. Uh, what was interesting was there were times I was the only woman in the room, and I would think to myself, well, I should say something. And then I thought, well, people will think that what I say is stupid, so I won't speak. And then some man said it and everybody thought it was brilliant. And I got really mad at myself and I had made up my mind that I would make myself speak in every meeting. And when I went to teach at Georgetown, I, this was my mantra that everybody had to interrupt, men and women. Uh, my classes, not raise your hand, but interrupt. My classes were a bit of a zoo but it uh, kind of taught me that one needed to interrupt if you're gonna be heard. <clears throat> so then I go to the United Nations and I was a member obviously of the United States of, on the Security Council and I was the only woman. There were 14 men there uh, and on my first meeting, which didn't take place in that fancy room, but in a back room, there are 14 men sitting there with their arms closed and looking at me and I thought to myself, well, maybe I won't speak today. And then I saw the sign that said United States. And I thought, I am here representing the United States. If I don't speak, uh, I, the voice of the United States will not be heard. <clears throat> but it really didn't get easier in many ways because even though I was a cabinet member and I participated in what are known as the principals meetings on national security decision-making, I literally would be told not to be so emotional when I argued on behalf of doing something in Bosnia, or the national security advisor would tap his fingers while I spoke, in other words, because I was taking too long. So I did learn to argue differently uh, so that I would not be accused of being emotional. But so I, my kind of uh, trek through all this has been a bit of up and down, but I have to say uh, my youngest granddaughter, when she was, 10, eight years ago, said, so what's the big deal about Grandma Maddie being Secretary of State? Only girls are Secretary of State. And that was when Condi and Hillary were Secretaries of State. So um, it's uh, the way you see it. It's kind of fun to, to see the, the things have been happening. And there are a couple of boys that have been trying to be Secretary of State. <laughs> yes, we've seen them trying to measure up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, but you're right to note that it doesn't take much to change uh, the perspectives, especially of kids uh, and of young people who don't necessarily, you know, they say if you can't see it, you can't be it. Um, and so I wonder, as we look at Kamala Harris now taking on this historic role, not only as the third female nominee for vice president on a major party ticket, but the first woman of color in that role. Um, she's already facing the kind of sexist attacks that we knew she would face. She's already facing some racist attacks as well. Um, but we've also seen young women and especially young black girls really inspired by seeing her in this role. Um, how much do you think it matters to America, to our democracy, to have women in the roles that you've held as national security advisor in the cabinet as vice president and God willing one day soon president. I think it does make a difference. And I have to tell you the number of letters uh, that I get from young women, girls that are saying they're writing a paper about me or uh, would, they would like to be secretary of state or president. And it's really very um, inspiring in many different ways. I have to tell you, um, in ninth, we had another woman named 
uh, to be the vice presidential candidate, Geraldine Ferraro in 1984. Um, and I was her foreign policy advisor. And it was interesting to travel with her and see how many young girls would come up to her and would be really excited about what she was doing. And at the same time, there were other people who thought she couldn't do the job. I mean, it, so it's a mixed bag. But I think that um, Senator Harris, Kamala Harris, um, is really a remarkable person. I do know her. I think she's going to be, um, she already is a very strong public figure. Uh, and I think it will make a difference. Uh, and it is a big step forward. And it has made a difference that some, there have been women in other positions, but it will ultimately uh, be one of the major, major uh, changes in our life if we have a woman vice president uh, and if we could have a woman president. And we can, and we will, I'm confident. I think the part that drives me crazy is we always wanna be number one, but the bottom line is there are many countries in the world that actually have women presidents or prime ministers. So uh, we are very much behind in this. Yes, and I, I wanna come back to that and to your work with the National Democratic Institute on women in politics in just a minute. Um, but if I may, you know, just ask you a couple of questions about being an American. Um, you've often called yourself a, a grateful American. You came to this country as someone who was a refugee twice over. Um, and I know your parents used to call you on July 4th and your mother would make sure that you were celebrating July 4th and singing patriotic songs. Why was that so important to her that she would actually call and check in? Well, because we all were very grateful Americans and uh, very patriotic Americans. But I have to uh, parenthetically say I came from Czechoslovakia. And what was interesting was the first president of Czechoslovakia was married to an American, Charlotte Gehrig Masaryk. He took her um, uh, maiden name as his middle name, but the amazing part is the Czechoslovak constitution written in 1918 was modeled on the American one with a major exception. It had equal rights language in it then. Um, so I'm very proud of that part of it. But I have to say, we really were so grateful to be in America having spent World War II in London, and then uh, when the communists took over Czechoslovakia, and my mother would call, and she really cared as to whether the children were singing patriotic songs, and we were so, there's no way to describe this, Tammy, in terms of our gratitude for being in America. And when we came here, my father said, America was different from every country, because when we came, they said, we're so sorry, your country's been taken over by a terrible system, you're welcome here. What can we do to help you? And when will you become a citizen? And that was our major goal, to become American citizens. So I was reflecting uh, about what it means to be a citizen and, and what it means to have the right to vote. This is obviously something we are having a huge national conversation about, not only because we're marking the anniversary of women's suffrage, but because there are a lot of challenges to the right to vote and to voter participation in this year's election. Um, and I have two kids. One is just over voting age and the second will be voting for the first time this year. Uh, and I think a lot about what his first vote is going to feel like. He feels very cynical. He feels frustrated. He feels angry. You know, and I remember my first vote feeling really excited. Um, I'm, I'm curious whether you remember the first time you were able to vote and what that felt like to you. Well, I certainly remember we became citizens. I became a, citizens, a citizen in 1957 between my sophomore and junior year at Wellesley. And my first vote was in 1960 in Chicago for John Kennedy. And just being in Chicago at the time, there were these incredible parades before. Um, and a great sense of uh, that this was a, a major election and great joy with everything that was going on. I will never forget that vote. Um, and it's one that made me the proudest, I have to say. And then we came to Washington um, and I was here when John Kennedy was president and it really was stunning. By the way, I had met him when um, he was running for the Senate and I was at Wellesley and I was a reporter and I got his autograph 
which I still have. Um, but I really, uh, I so remember my first vote and it was spectacular in every way. Wow, and that was a year and a candidate who really felt like a transformational candidate, a turnover yeah. of generations in politics and- Very uh, much, and no year, question. This year is a little different, I guess. Um, let's, let's come back to that in a minute, but um, you and I have gotten to know one another because I have the good fortune to serve with you on the board of the National Democratic Institute which works to support democracy all around the world and help make democracy work for people. Um, and you travel constantly uh, to countries where NDI works, meeting among others with women activists and with women who are running for political office. And I know that one focus of NDI's work recently has been on the challenges and especially the violence faced by women who put themselves forward into the political sphere. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what you hear from those women that you meet with, whether it's, you know, in Kosovo or, uh, you know, anywhere you go, um, what, what are the big challenges they're facing and what can we do here to better support women who are willing to put themselves out there? Well, first of all, let me say that when I became secretary, I decided to put women's issues central to American foreign policy, not just because I'm a feminist, but because it makes sense. More than half the population in practically every country is female, and it is a loss of a resource um, if women are not a part of political systems. And NDI, we have really made a point of supporting women candidates in countries and helping them kind of sort out about how one does elections and um, try to be as supportive as possible. I have gone around a lot, and the thing that I have found troubling is that you often find that the women that you have persuaded to run for office are actually then subjected to violence uh, because there are those who don't want them there. They threaten them in some form or another or threaten their families so that it makes them nervous about running. And so what NDI has done, and we started doing this in 2016, is to link up with a program at the United Nations called Not the Cost, trying to stop the violence against women in politics. And, and I remember one of the trips I took actually was to Mexico where we had managed, there were more women that were candidates. And then I did speak to them about this issue of uh, being singled out uh, and then um, attacked for what they were doing or threatened. And so I think that we need to understand the continuing violence against women in countries generally. Um, and then also then to understand that once they have made the step to run, that there has to be some way to make sure that there's not violence against them. One of the issues that I've been very involved in recently is to try to figure out uh, the women in Afghanistan uh, who interestingly enough um, had quite a lot of uh, power and uh, were able to participate in government before um, the horrors with the Taliban. And so one of the things that I've been involved in is trying to make sure that they are involved now uh, in whatever negotiations are taking place for Afghanistan, not just to be questioned about what their uh, situation is, but to be a part of the negotiation. So it's important to have women that, are, that participate, that use their skills, um, and then are not uh, punished for doing it. So I think this is a very, very important issue. Well, and we, we have a lot of data now that having women as an integral part of peace negotiations actually makes the resulting agreements more durable, right? Absolutely. So, uh, and it is the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Women's Conference. Uh, which also was a big step forward. Um, and I think that we need to understand that, that this makes a big difference. And by the way, if I, if I may, the countries that have been able to deal with the virus are ones that are run by women. Um, you know, uh, it hasn't been easy. New Zealand, Taiwan, Germany, uh, Denmark, Sweden, you know, Iceland, it's interesting. And I do think that women do have special talents for governance. Um, and 
that it's important to be a part of a political, to be politically and economically empowered. Right. And of course, uh, societies that are willing to elect women as their senior leaders probably also have a set of values that are more inclusive and more ready to embrace the solutions that women leaders can offer. Very much so. Um, so, Madeline, you have spent the last few decades of your life not in government, not in the room where the decisions are being made, except on the Defense Policy Board, but as an advisor and also, especially at NDI and on women's empowerment, you are a very vocal advocate. You're out there uh, leading the charge and pushing those who are in government. And, you know, this has been a year of an incredible outpouring of public mobilization, born out of frustration, but also evidencing a lot of passion and persistence and determination to make change. And I wonder, as you reflect on the roles you played inside this system and as an advocate outside the system, how do you think about that relationship, that push and pull between pressure and advocacy and policy making and politics? So how important are these protests that we see today? How important is my 18 year old's vote versus his going to a demonstration? Well, let me just say what I have found most interesting in political systems generally is the relationship between those on the inside and those on the outside. And what is true and needs to be true in a democracy is that those in the government actually listen to those outside, which we call civil society, uh, and really uh, understand that a democracy needs to respond to the needs of the people who have elected them. Um, and so, and I have been on the inside and on the outside. And it, by the way, it really did take me uh, quite a long time to find my voice and I'm not gonna be quiet now. So the, the bottom line is, I think that, and one of the things, and you know this at NDI, we are very concerned also about how civil society operates. Um, and I do think that part of it is to be able to express views, to be able to uh, have peaceful uh, demonstrations to make clear what has to be done. And I think that a democratic government that really can function well needs to have that input from the outside, um, that that is a major part. And that an awful lot of our society um, is uh, made up obviously of most of them of people that are on the outside. Um, and I think it's interesting when we talk about the private sector having a role in national security making, um, corporations, non-governmental organizations, uh, various groupings, uh, various uh, ways now that people communicate through, um, well, what Tia, uh, Tia Chen was talking about, you know, or really having uh, organizations. I do think that it's essential for uh, people to express their views uh, in a number of different ways. And it is what makes democracy. And I've been saying over and over again, democracy is not a spectator sport. It is something that we all need to participate in and make our views known in a peaceful way as to where change should come about. So I think it's very, very important. And I cheer on those that are doing those kinds of things. And I am, um, I am trying to speak out as much as people will listen to me. Well, Secretary Madeleine Albright, we are very grateful that you are not going to be quiet. Uh, right. And we look forward to, to hearing from you uh, for a long time to come. Thank you so much for joining us today and helping us mark this important centennial. And Camille, over to you. Thank you so much for inviting me to do this. And Camille, thank you. And, and Tammy, it's great working with you wherever we do this. You are fantastic. Thank you very, very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.